Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder when I step off the train and deliver an episode to you while I walk home. I'm Brendan Riley. Greetings, dear listener. It is another warm day here in Chicago. It is Wednesday, May 2nd. I'm pleased to be speaking to you as I walk home. It is the second to last week of my semester. I finished a whole passel of conferences today, so my writing students are properly reassured about their papers and or chastened to finish them up in a solid way before the semester ends. Well, I am looking today to record the next episode of my rules-related podcasts. But uh, maybe I'll take a moment to apologize for the scheduling snafu last week. Normally, I release the podcast on a Wednesday and a Friday, as well as a Monday. But this time around, apparently what I did is I I released it on a Monday, then I recorded. I had one queued up for Wednesday... Then I recorded on Tuesday the episode for Friday, which I then inadvertently released on Tuesday. And I discovered once you release it, you can't unrelease it. I could delete it, but that seemed confusing. So fortunately, they were numbered properly. So I just then released the next episode right away. So you may have found episodes 38 and 39 in your pod feed of choice in the wrong order. I'm just going to leave them that way. But this episode, because I really can't take the time to do more than three episodes a week, I probably should only be be doing two. So this episode is going to be appearing next Monday, which would be the 6th or 7th, I think. 7th? Be the 7th. So that you are listening presumably on May 7th to an episode I recorded on May 2nd which is the third part of the episodes that came out last week about rules. So that was a long explanation for a short answer. So what I want to talk about today, in the past two episodes I talked about rules. First I talked about when you're writing rule books, how do you negotiate and understand the comments that you get from other people regarding their rule, your rule books. Uh, in the second episode, I talked a bit about writing those rule books and making changes to them. In this episode, I wanted to talk a bit about the different kinds of rule books I've encountered and which ones were really good. So I'm going to point to a number of different types of rule books as I've encountered them in uh, games and point to the ones that I think were most effective. I already mentioned two episodes ago, or maybe last episode, honestly, I can't remember. I already mentioned the idea of rule books that were uh, they use the fantasy flight model of a learning section and a reference section. So I'm not going to talk about those much more. Uh, you can refer to the previous episodes to think about that. But there are a number of different ways to approach rule book writing. The first is clinical. Uh, and I will point to... So I haven't played very many war games. I understand war games to be particularly uh, aggressive as clinical rule books. But... The company I would point to here is Queen Games. Queen Games has what I would call a clinical style to their rule books. In part, they're all the same. If you get a Queen game and you look at the rule book, it's written in exactly the same form as other Queen games, which maybe is intentional. They want you to be able, once you've learned how to play a Queen game, you can learn how to play any of the Queen games. But it might also just be laziness. They paid a graphic designer one time in the early 2000s to lay out a rule book, and they've just used the same design every, with everyone since. Uh, but it's, it's a successful model. It's very, a very practical approach, but it, and it does explain the theme. But I would say my critique is that it, it feels too disconnected, that the rule book feels uh, overly... Ah, what's the word I'm looking for? I said clinical like four times already, so... Spartan? No, that's a different type. Dry. The queen rulebooks are dry. Uh, 
the design is generally not appealing, and it makes reading the rulebook feel like a chore, which is not fun. Uh, the second type of rulebook I will point to is the sparse rulebook. Sparse rulebook one is one that maybe supplies the information you need, but doesn't spend a lot of time on learning or on nuance. And often as a result, what you get is a game where you have an intellectual concept of how to play, but when you actually go to play it, you're missing so much that the game becomes very difficult. Um, I know that I've played games like this. Typically this is a Kickstarter problem. Uh, full disclosure, speaking as a guy who made a Kickstarter game where the rule book was difficult to follow, but I don't think we, we suffered from the problem of sparseness in our rule book. But often, when you have a rule book that hasn't properly been blind play tested, I find, the, there are missing elements, questions that just never got asked because all the people trying to use the rule book to learn already kind of knew the game. And it's only when you leave out the assumptions of people who know what the game's supposed to be do you find those really crucial gaps in what the rule book actually is. So I would say spar sparseness is a problem with a particular kind of rule book. And often the, the place where sparseness causes the most suffering is in the gap between what the rules say you can do and what, you're su what the gameplay is supposed to feel like. That uh, I've certainly had games where I read the rule book and I got to the end and I had a sense of how the game is supposed to work, but I had no sense of what, what I'm doing when I play it. Uh, and sometimes that's just because the, the complexities of the game demand that you discover that what you're doing part once you're playing, but uh, it still could be a bit disconnected that way. The third kind of rule book that I would like to mention today would be the, the overwhelming rule book, the rule book that's full, chock full of stuff, and perhaps maybe too much in that direction. Uh, you might call this the old Fantasy Flight model. That the old Fantasy Flight rule books, which tended to be for games that were chock full of nuance and um, extra bits, that the old Fantasy Flight rule books tended to be very full. I'm thinking of, I mentioned a, a few weeks ago, I played the game Rex, which is in the Twilight Imperium universe, that rule book was chock full of stuff and there'd be all these little side elements and nuances that for most plays didn't, weren't necessary. And it, be, it became really challenging to conceive of how to play because so many bits of extra information were scattered throughout. I would think for, I think for me, the biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The biggest violator of this rule would be Apocrypha, the adventure card game, which is a game I was really excited about when it came out, and I'm still looking forward to, to it, but I got it a while ago, and I haven't been able to bring myself to play it because the rule book is so confusing, uh, and I watched the how to play videos, and <laughs> they were confusing too. Uh, it was only after watching the, the video from Richard Ham Rado running through the game that I that I started to understand it. But I think the Rado diagnosed the problem with the Apocrypha rulebook is that it's designed around a complex card game. And so in writing the rulebook, they did their best to include all of the all of the things you might encounter so that when you're playing it you can understand any particular situation. The problem is when you're learning it, all of those situations feel extraneous and uh, having all of those there makes it really hard to see the forest for the trees. Um, so I would call the elaborate rule book a problem, and I would say that's also a problem if you're somebody who, who's interested in creating complex games. The elaborate rule book becomes the problem because you want to over-explain everything. And that's one of the places where my preference for concise language comes into contrast with, say, my co-developer Rob's tendency to explain things in great detail that often will he'll explain something in a way that I consider over explaining it and then I'll cut it down and somebody will be like well you didn't you didn't explain that thing and I was like oh yeah that was in the version Rob wrote so the back and forth uh, that 
is shaped by the difference between being too concise and too verbose is an interesting one. Finally, the last kind of rule book I wanted to point to today is what I would call the thematic rule book. And uh, there's two types, or I would say there's a sliding scale of quality, as is true of all of these models. But So there's a quality issue at play in a thematic rule book. In a good thematic rule book, the theme of the game is explained and integrated into the rules in such a way that you can understand why you would do the things you do but the game is explained clearly enough that you uh, that you can still understand what you're supposed to do and you can kind of divorce that from the theme if you need to. Um, in games that take that too far, often it's because they have integrated the theme very thoroughly, but have done so through the use of jargon or language that makes it more difficult to play the game. You'll recall that in the last episode I mentioned the idea of using language to make some things easier or harder in playing a game. And you recall in the last episode I talked about the idea of choosing to include language or leave language out that makes it easier to conceive of particular ideas versus using language that people don't understand. The difference between saying active or inactive to represent available for players to use and saying orthogonal as the opposite of diagonal without explaining it. So when you're using fantastical ideas, sometimes people will want to use specialized terms for non-specialized things. Like, for instance, you might have a game where you're drafting cards, but maybe in the parlance of the game, the cards you're drafting represent demons you're summoning. So you might call it the summoning round, and you'd say, you get a collection of demons, and then you summon one of them. And actually what you're doing is taking a card out of the hand. You're drafting it. And instead of using the phrase select a card or draft a card, you say you're summoning the card. So the problem with this, of course, is that it isn't shorthand for something, it's just an alternate word that people need to use. By contrast, if summoning means a bunch of things that are sort of condensed into one action, then summoning becomes a fine stand-in for this longer phrase. So I would say one of the dangers of a thematic rulebook is overusing the theme and obscuring the actions of the game. On the other hand, uh, you could also look at theme as helping to explain something. Uh, I think I've mentioned before, my favorite rule book is the Dungeon Pets rule book. It does a very good job of explaining a very complicated game. One of my favorite parts is its approach to the meat market and the uh, pet market. So in Dungeon Pets, you're buying pets and raising them and the pet market has older pets and younger pets. When you take a uh, at the end of the round, if there's a pet in the three year pen it is removed from the game and in the rule book it says it's sent to live on a farm. In an unrelated rule or in a completely unrelated rule whenever an animal is sent to live on the farm add two meat to the meat market. Right, so part of the, the idea of the game there is that if an animal is left too long, it's added to the meat market. It's a funny thematic element, but it's also a nice bit of humor that ties that rule in solidly. No one ever forgets that rule. Um, and I would think that's the height of thematic rule book writing, is if you write a rule that no one ever forgets. So I'm curious, readers, uh, if you were to visit me on Board Game Geek Guild 3269, what do you see as your favorite rule book? What are the key elements that we should be watching for? Uh, what, what do you like? What kind of rule book do you enjoy? Pop in and, and let me know. In the meantime, get out there and enjoy the weather. Take a long walk. And I hope that that nice walk you take is as pleasant as mine was. Take care. Bye.
brought to you by Rattlebox Games. <laughs>